All right. They had clarity on the one main thing. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of what Jesus did alone. Uh, and you don't have to do all that other Jewish stuff. But I think they also started recognizing how hard it was for the Jewish Christians, many of them, to concede that point. And so they also exercised grace and humility in return. And, and they didn't insist on their rights. And they were willing to make some sacrifices and to do things that the Jewish Christians asked out of love for their brothers and sisters in Christ and out of harmony for the church. And in doing that, they were actually demonstrating a mature faith. They were demonstrating that they were living and loving like Jesus, um, who didn't, uh, Philippians chapter 2, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and made himself nothing and humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. All right, now probably, get this, probably there's a lot of individuals in the church who aren't 100% excited about this decision. All right, there are probably some who what they still wanted was unison. They wanted their melody being played and the only one being played. But because of their core principles and out of love for one another, they ended up in harmony. Ended up going from to that ah. Right? And, and that's a really good place to be. So how do we translate that to today? And to solving differences, whether it's at home or if you're a follower of Jesus, if it's also in your church. Several life lessons. Again, life lesson number one, stand on principle, not practice. Um, figure out what's primary. What are those things that you have to stick to no matter what? And differentiate that from what's secondary. What, what are those things that there's really room for compromise even if you don't feel like it? Think about what would it look like at your home or in your church if you did that. Life lesson number two, where a core principle isn't at stake, choose peace over practice. Right. Where a core principle isn't at stake, be willing to sacrifice rights for the sake of the relationship. What would it look like, again, at home, if you were willing to do that? At church, if you were willing to do that? If you were willing to give up something because it bothered the other person? if you were willing to live with things you didn't like for the sake of the other person. Here's something that'll help you maybe do that. Life lesson number three, there's a value in the other perspective, even if it's not yours. Even if it's totally different from yours, there's a value in it. See, over time, the Gentile Christians learn some of the rich value and symbolism in some of those centuries-old religious practices of the Jews. And the Jewish Christians learned to experience the joy of grace and that the law was a, was a gift and the value of emotion as well as ritual. All right, two widely different perspectives, two widely different strengths, yet they began to realize that both were gifts and blessings to each other. And, and something that, when seen from the right perspective, again, helped them resolve that different differences and made the harmony richer. So again, I want, I want to ask you, what would, it, what would it be like if you applied that principle at home or in your marriage or in your church? What if you saw the value of the things that you didn't like, or that's just different from what you grew up with? What if you learned to appreciate the differences rather than just complaining about them? What if you learned to see how differences, especially different strengths, can actually complement each other in a relationship and can make the relationship as a whole stronger? Life lesson number four. The way to resolution is when both people move. Well, that's a hard one, isn't it? Because we want the other person to move. Because usually we think we're right and that our particular note is best. Uh, 
And most often, that just keeps the dissonance going uh, rather than leading to a resolution. What you see in the story in Acts 15, both Jewish and Gentile Christians moved, didn't they? And they discovered when they moved, the resolution again was a beautiful harmony, and it gave them a lot of joy. What would it look like in your marriage, in your home, in your church, if you both moved? And life lesson number five, the way to resolution involves sacrifice. It goes along with that last one, doesn't it? The way to resolution often involves sacrifice. All right, you sacrifice. You give something up for the sake of your brother or sister. Because what you've discovered is, tweet this, all right? The relationship is usually more important than rights. The relationship is usually more important than being right. Sometimes that means you do something you don't really want to out of love and concern for your brother or sister in Christ or love and concern for your family member, your spouse. Sometimes that means you don't do something that you could. Again, out of love and respect for your spouse or your family member or somebody in church because they'd be hurt or offended if you did it. Now, doesn't that make sense? I mean, why would you purposefully do something that, that would offend a brother or sister? So why would you do it in the church where you're called brothers and sisters in Christ? Is these life five life lessons, they're going to work um, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. But there's also something, if you're a follower of Jesus, that you have something else that helps you solve disagreements. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you're also Jesus-centered and spirit-filled. And, and that means you bring something to the table in addition to those things we've talked about. Spirit-filled means you're in prayer about these things. And you're seeking the Spirit's direction and guidance and a wisdom that comes from God. Jesus-centered means that grace has grabbed hold of your heart. And as grace has grabbed hold of your heart, you start to realize not only that Jesus loves and forgives you, but that he also loves and forgives and died for that person that you're in such a disagreement about. And then you start to realize, because you're Jesus-centered, that Jesus is actually working in you and, and working in you to make you more like him. So Jesus is working in you to, to help you be more humble. Jesus is working in you, giving you a, a willingness to sacrifice. Jesus is working in you, helping you find a joy in giving and in giving things up for the sake of the relationship. Jesus is working in you so, so that if you've been hurt in the disagreement, and oh, that happens so much, if you've been hurt in the disagreement, Jesus is working in you, helping you to forgive others as you've been forgiven by him. And he's also working in you, helping you to figure out that you really are one body, connected to Christ. And if those core principles aren't at stake, that the relationship matters more than being right. What happens if you put that to work in your home? in your marriage, in your family, in your church. Putting all that into practice, guys, it helps resolve the tension. It helps you work through those differences and disagreements and move from that mm, dissonance to uh, resolution, harmony, from insistence on, on my note to experiencing the beauty 